The million dollar question, how do entrepreneurs transition from self-employed to owning a business that turns a profit? My name is Chris Waters and this podcast has the million dollar answer. Welcome to CEO Secrets. Hey guys, welcome to another exciting episode of CEO Secrets. I am super excited about our guest today. He is one of the foremost experts when it comes to flipping and ultimately growing your net income in the real estate industry. I'd like to welcome Mike Simmons to the show today. Mike, how are you doing? Hey man, thanks for having me, Chris. I appreciate it. I'm doing great, by the way. I'm excited about this. So Mike, you're a real estate investor, podcaster, speaker. I heard you uh, share the stage with Gary Vaynerchuk at Agent 2021 Conference. How was that? That was, uh, it was mind blowing. It was amazing. Uh, it was an incredible setup that he did. It was the first year that he was doing it. So it was a four year, the plan was for four years. And it was year number one. It was at the Miami Dolphin Stadium. And uh, I tell you what, the uh, production level was off the charts. It was amazing. I've spoken at other things, but this was the next level. Did you get to spend any time with Gary? What was he like? Uh, a little bit. It's interesting. I was one of the speakers. The conferences I'm used to going to, if you're a speaker, like you're you're behind the scenes. You can talk to anybody you want. At Gary's event, he does get sort of ushered in and ushered out a little bit. There wasn't tons of just him hanging out, but I did get a chance to hang out with him a little bit, which was very, very cool. The way that it came about, though, was was interesting, and I think it's a really good kind of a lesson for folks. Um, I, you know, it kind of happened to me in a strange way, but I think there's a lesson to be learned there. So I was uh, reaching out. I, I have an Instagram and, and some things that I do, my podcast. And I thought, I listen to Gary. I like him. I like his stuff. I, I really resonate with the way he kind of approaches life. And I said, I'm just going to reach out to him. He talks about it all the time, right? Just reach out to people, pick up the phone and call or reach out, whatever. So I DM'd him through Instagram. And I'm like, hey, you know, love you, love your stuff. I'd love to get you on my show. Like, I'd love to talk to you. And I did this like maybe half a dozen times at different times throughout like a month. And then out of nowhere, I get an email from Vayner Media saying, hey, uh, Gary wanted me to reach out. We're having this event. We'd love you to speak at it. And there's no way in the world they knew about me other than the fact that I had been kind of reaching out to, to Gary via Instagram. He must have saw it, looked at, you know, looked into me a little bit, saw some of my stuff and said, hey, this guy can talk. Let's get him on stage. Sounds like he knows what he's talking about. Like, that's the only explanation. But the point being is, don't assume you can't get through to somebody. Don't assume that you can't get something done. Like, pick up the phone, send a DM, send an email, like whatever, but like, like, don't just try. If you don't try, you're not going to get it. Now he's never been on my podcast, but I was able to share the stage with him at his event, agent 2021. It was surreal. It was awesome. That was cool. What was his main message for real estate agents at that, at that conference? It was really about social media and it, it's kind of the same message all the time, right? This thing is the television of our time. Like you need to be on these platforms. That's where the future of not just real estate, but it was agent 2021. So it was just, it wasn't just real estate. It was like insurance and travel agents. Like it was like di a couple different industries where they have agents and real estate was one of them. So Chris, uh, not Chris, um, Sirhan, can't remember his first name now. Ryan Sirhan. Uh, Ryan Sirhan, thank you. Yeah. He was one of the featured speakers at the event too. So, you know, it's interesting, like that I kind of, I struggle with or that I'm, I don't know, a little frustrated with as a marketer is when I think about social media, you know, when you've got a, a product that can be sold across the country, social media can be amazing and this incredible lever. But in like, let's say, for example, you have a real estate brokerage or, you know, maybe an investment office in a, in a specific city or you're an insurance agent, uh, you know, if you're leveraging social media, like you know, it's very difficult to, uh, you know, sell your service, for example, to somebody that lives halfway across the United States, you know, that like, your service isn't even applicable. Yeah. And so for, for businesses that have geographic restrictions, social media is challenging. And then like, if you think about, you know, the things you can do to like, you know, grow your following, for example, like getting influencers and ambassadors and stuff, like even those guys, their followers are all over the country. And yeah. so if they like, say you get them to endorse you, you know, they, they could be endorsing 50% of their audience that has, doesn't even live in the same city. Yeah. And so, and then I don't know what your experience has been on the investing front, but when we run Facebook promoted ads that are, you know, geo targeted and like Google AdWord targeted ads, like the lead quality of digital leads, uh, you know, just very low quality. Like you have to work a lot of them to convert. Not that yeah. it doesn't work and 
you know, it's very profitable. It's just, you know, it's just, it's tough at scale to generate, you know, high quality leads through digital. What are your, what's your opinion and thoughts on this from the investment side? I don't disagree with you. I, we have struggled with social media for finding leads, but, but I think you have to look at what you just said and how it's difficult to utilize social media in a smallish geographic location. But what, if you think about it a little bit differently, like what, what would I want to tell people who don't live around me or who do I want to connect with that maybe isn't in my market? And for me and a lot of investors, especially flippers, investors, like private money investors, like if you're, if you have this channel that you're talking about what you're doing and you're showing yourself as an expert, I've always used social media as more of a way to attract private money into my business so that I can build my business. And I think building it on the back of private money, especially for flippers is probably the smartest way you can go. So they don't need to be local. They just need to know, trust, and think that you're doing a great thing. And there's plenty of people who have money that want to put it into real estate and just don't know where to go, who to go to. So I think that application is really, really great. When it comes to seller leads, we've struggled using social media to get really great. We've done it, but it never seems to be sustainable. And it always seems to get kind of expensive. And like you said, you have to go through an awful lot of leads to find good ones. It makes total sense, the application of social media for getting private investors. Speaking of um, just getting consumers from a lead generation perspective, what are your top three sources, you know, getting great deals to acquire? I'll tell you my, my top two. There's two and then everything else is a distant third and fourth and whatever. My top source for getting uh, great seller leads, matter of fact, it's probably fueled 70% of the revenue that I've made in the last five years has come from direct mail just has, you know, I think as hard as we try as real estate investors to move into the digital age and sort of stop doing some of these archaic things like direct mail, the fact of the matter is it still works. So that's, that's really been my workhorse. Now, second place and really in 2021 leaped into first place was pay-per-click Google AdWords. So pay-per-click advertising for me went from maybe 30% of my revenue or maybe 25% of my revenue to like 60, 65% of my revenue in 2020. And I, the reason I believe for that happening, because it happened like a brick wall, like all this direct mail all of a sudden stopped working and pay-per-click surged. And the reason why I believe that happened was it happened right when the pandemic hit. And depending on where you are in the country, you've had a different experience with COVID than maybe other people. In Michigan, where I'm from, we were one of the hardest hit in the beginning, and we have been over the whole country, we've been one of the most restrictive states about social gatherings and restaurants and things like that. So when it first happened, if you remember, there was this fear in certain areas of actually touching mail, touching packages and things like that. So what happened was COVID hit, everyone freaked out, and all of a sudden our mail wasn't working anymore. And I think people were just really hesitant to touch anything that had come from somebody else. And so our mail just really took a dive, but people were at home and they were on their phone and on the computer. And so pay-per-click surged and it kind of went into first place for us. And we've gotten most of our deals from pay-per-click over the last 12 months. Cool. Are you sending on the direct mail side? Are you sending actual letters or are you sending postcards? Postcards. I'm, you know, until it's proven otherwise, I'm going to be pretty adamant about postcards. And here's why. I believe that mail is way more about timing than it is presentation. It doesn't mean you need a bat, you want a bad presentation, but I think you're you're more likely to screw up the message on a postcard or a letter than you are to find the perfect message. I don't think there's a perfect message, but I think there's definitely things people do to absolutely screw it up and give themselves no chance. But all things being equal, you have a pretty good letter message, you have a pretty good postcard message. I will always choose the postcard because if it's about timing, okay, Chris, I send you a, a postcard and I say, hey, Chris, I wanna buy your, your house at this address. I can pay cash, I can close quickly. All the things that people say, and you have no interest in selling your house, it goes right in the garbage. You don't even give it a second thought, right? But if I hit you the day that your wife says, I want a divorce and we've got to sell the house or you lose a job or you have a death or whatever. If I hit you on that day, even a mediocre message, you'll keep it because now you need this. This is something you're interested in. So if it's about timing, then frequency 
is more important than quality. Doesn't mean quality doesn't matter, but I think frequency matters more. So if frequency matters more and postcards are cheaper, I can send more of them out for less money. I'm going to go with postcards. That's sort of the economics and the, and the rationale behind postcards for me. When you're looking at the database to build, to decide who to mail to, what are the attributes, you know, in terms of like your ideal avatar that you're plugging into whatever software to decide who to mail? What are those attributes you're layering yep. in? Yeah. So for me, in real estate, we're we're fortunate that we can help a lot of people a lot of different ways. There's a lot of ways to skin a cat. But the way that I can most often help people is when there's some equity in the deal. So I consider equity to be king. I want to talk to people who have equity because ultimately we have a lot more options with the more equity that they have. Doesn't mean you can't help people with no equity. I know you can. There's creative financing, all that stuff. But we look for equity and we also look for age because in the last five years, I've closed over 500 deals and I'll bet you 85% of them, the people were over the age of 60 easily. And the other ones, they were over the age of 40 for sure. So I really focused heavily on people over the age of 40 and with at least 50% equity in their home. And then so for me, I kind of cast a big net and I want to talk to anybody with equity. Now, I know that niche lists are really, really popular with people like code violations and tax delinquent and all that stuff. And those are great because they're very time sensitive. When people have those situations, they're kind of in a hurry to fix that problem. I get it. But those lists have to be refreshed a lot. And ultimately, if I find someone with a code violation, for example, and they're completely upside down in their mortgage, it's harder to help them than somebody with a code violation who has equity. And so if I'm looking for a niche list, but I'm really most interested in people who have equity on that list, why don't I just mail to everyone who has equity? And if they're on a code violation, a tax delinquent, whatever, if they're on one of these specialty lists, I'll hit them anyway, because I'm hitting people all the time. Like once a month, you're getting a card from me if you're on my list. How many, how big is your database? Uh, boy, it's grown a lot recently, but for the most part, it's in the 125 to 150,000 range, something like that before last, I'm sorry, but before last year, I was mailing out approximately 60,000 pieces a month. So to get, so if somebody wants to close 500 uh, deals a year, they're going to need to mail out 60,000 postcards per month. And then also how much do they need to spend in Google AdWords? Well, let's put it this way. I, I closed 500, over 500 deals over the last five years, not per okay. year. So let's be okay. clear. I don't want to over, over inflate my business here, but 60,000 pieces a month. And my budget for AdWords is $10,000. Now that's important because with Google AdWords, you, you set a budget of what you are willing to spend. You don't always spend that. So I, the, the point with Google AdWords, assuming you have marketing budget, you have a decent amount of money for marketing, you always want your budget to be higher than the actual spend because the minute your spend bumps up against your budget, AdWords stop and you, you start losing opportunities. So I saw for me that my spend to stay in the number one or number two position in my market was about, around seven or $8,000 a month. So I set my limit to 10 just for a number. And I wanted it to be a number that was beyond what I felt like I would have to spend to be number one or number two. So how many deals did you close last year? Last year, we closed less deals. The pandemic hit and we had to, we had to adjust a little bit, but we ended up closing about 70 deals as opposed to the hundred that we normally do. However, I will say this last year, we had our best year from a profit standpoint. So in prior years, we closed 100 deals and we were hovering right around a 20 to 25% profit margin. Last year, we closed 70, but we were closer to 35% profit margin. We just, we became smarter and leaner when the pandemic hit. We had to let some folks go. We started doing things a little bit differently internally and we were able to be more, and it doesn't hurt that the market is red hot too, right? Throughout most of last year, the market was pretty damn hot. Yeah. Interesting. So if somebody wants to get enough leads to close 7,200 deals, they need to budget 10 grand a month. And that obviously can all, you know, deviations there, depending on what market you're in. Yep. Um, and then to send out roughly 60,000 postcards a month to generate enough leads to close 70 to hundred deals. In my market, that's what historically we've spent. We, we've been in the between 20 and 30 grand a month spend for marketing. Remind me, what market are you in, um, Mike? Michigan. Michigan. Where, what city? So we're north. I happen to live north of Detroit, but we're, we market to what they call the tri-county area, which is Oakland, Wayne, and Macomb. 
Detroit is in Wayne County. I live about a half an hour north of Detroit, but we our market is the, the entire Tri-County area, minus Detroit. We don't actually market to the city of Detroit. It just doesn't make sense for us. Cool. You know, I, I asked in a questionnaire I sent to you, you know, something you'd like to uh, discuss and talk more about, and it's something you do, you know, outside of your, your core business, you know, is it fix and flip or wholesale? What are you doing? We do primarily wholesale, but we do some fix and flip as well. It just depends on where the money is. Got it. Um, so you are, you know, you're helping people, you call it level jumping, you know, how to grow uh, the business to doing over a million dollars in profits in just 12 months. Tell me more about that. Yeah. So level jumping is a book that I wrote. Uh, I actually took me a couple of years to write it. I released it. I published it in June of 2020. And what level jumping means is, you know, you hear people talk all the time about taking it to the next level, taking their business to the next level. It's always next level, next level, right? And to me, the next level is the level right above where you are. But what I have found and what I believe to be true is it's possible to, to skip levels, right? So just like when you're a kid, I don't know about you, but when I would go upstairs as a, as a young person, I would go two at a time, right? Just level, I was jumping higher than just the next step. And in business, I think we can do the same thing. And the way that I did it and the way that other people can do it is I surrounded myself with people who were performing and had businesses that were much beyond, far beyond where I was. They had the business that I wanted. And if you can surround yourself with the right people and ask the right questions, which is the right questions, by the way, are just questions, questions that you want to know. Like, how did you go from where you are I'm sorry, from where I am to where you are. How did you bridge the gap between my business, what I am? And this is exactly what I did. I, I sat down with a friend of mine, he's a good friend now, his name's Andy, and he had the business I wanted. And I said, you were where I am about four years ago. How did you get to where you are now? Like, what, what did you do in your business that moved the needle for you? And by the way, what did you do in your business that crashed and burned and you would tell me not to do it? And he, over a course of a few months, he kind of laid out what he did in his business. And I just thought... If it took him four or five years to go from where I am to where he is, and he had to figure all this out on his own, nobody was helping him, but he just gave me the playbook. Why can't I do that sooner? And I took that information, that knowledge, and I compress it, and I was able to do in a year what took him four years to do, because I had the playbook. I knew where the landmines were. I knew the path to walk. And I always say, if you can use other people's hindsight as your foresight, that's very, very powerful. And you can really, you can just accelerate your learning and accelerate your growth. And you can not just go to the next level. Because for me at the time, when I met Andy, my business was on about a $200,000 run rate. Like that was going to be my gross profits, 200,000. Within 12 months of meeting him, we did over a million dollars in gross profits, right? So I was able to accelerate all of that by using his hindsight as my guide guiding light going forward. And then I think people can do that, but people try to, I was stubborn. I was the last person who would ever, ever, ever pay to be in a mastermind mm -hmm. in 2014. If you would have asked me, I would have said, absolutely not. There is something called Google and you can learn anything you want to know on Google. And while that's technically true, it's very difficult to curate that information sometimes because as great as Google or bigger pockets or whatever you want to point to that has a lot of good information, there's 10 times more bad information that's intermixed with the good stuff. So knowing what, who to listen to, what to listen to, and what to do can be challenging sometimes. But if you can find somebody or a group of people that sort of have what you want and you can talk to them directly, I think that could be very, very powerful. I wrote that down just now. Let someone's hindsight be your foresight. That's a very profound statement. Um, Thank you. I actually made that up. <laughs> when I say that on podcasts, they always go, "Who said that? Where'd you hear that?" I made it up. So you you have a you have a mastermind you run. When did it start? You know, how many people are part of it? What type of people are in it? And um, yep. when you guys meet, like, how do you get involved in that? Yeah, great question. So the really simple answer to how did your business explode? What happened? I joined a mastermind. Okay. And everything that I learned in that mastermind that helped me really move forward, I put in my book, Level Jumping. The mastermind that I joined was called Seven Figure Flipping. At the time when I joined, it was 20 companies that met in uh, California. And all it was, was quarterly meetings by a small group of people in California. That group has now grown uh, to over 150 companies. We meet uh, more than four times a year, four to six times a year. 
and it's grown into this really kind of a, a mastermind with tons and tons of value and 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 things that uh, you get materials and things that you get to learn when you're in it. Now, I joined it, it, it transformed my business. And at the time, the guy who owned it, I, his name was Justin, I said, I want to get involved. I, I want to help people. I want to do for somebody else what was done for me. I want to kind of pay it back. And I got involved. And then uh, it's a long story. But fast forward a few years later, I'm one of the owners. I own, I'm one of the owners of the company. It's since changed hands who, who ultimately runs that company. But uh, the guy who runs it now, his name's Bill Allen, and uh, I was able to to buy in, get some ownership in the company, and and we train people and teach people how to either scale their business or get started, right? So if you're kind of in that beginning phase and, and you want to surround yourself with the right people from day one, we got you. If you already have a successful business, but you want to know what to do to really take it up to that next level or level jump, as I say, then then we have you there too. We have a product for that. Hmm. Interesting. I went and looked it up online. It's uh, sevenfigureflipping.com. Yep. And you asked what kind of people are in it. And I think this is important. I think there are groups out there that are can be intimidating for people. They can be a little bit of a boys club. Not to, I'm not naming names, so I can say that. Um, where it's kind of like this, this thing where... I don't know, you may or may not feel comfortable having your husband or wife be a part of it because it's kind of a little raucous. Uh, I would say that seven figure flipping, one of the one of the best things about it is it's very family friendly. P- husbands and wives comes. We have a guy who brings his teenage daughter, like young, like like 12, 13 year old daughter. Uh, she's involved. You can go and not have to worry about there being some kind of intimidating chest thumping you know, let's compare Ferraris. Like it's not that it's a real down to earth, uh, group of people. And we, we not only like share our wins, but we share our losses. We talk about things that we did wrong and things that didn't go well in our business to try to help people understand things can go wrong, but it's okay. Cause here's what we did. Here's how we survived it. And here's how you can avoid it, which is really, really important. I think sometimes groups tend to be, you know, People are trying to outdo each other. So they got pictures of themselves with wads of money and nice cars and getting on air, you know, private jets. That's fine. It's usually all fake for the record, but this is just a little bit more. And by the way, there are people who have seven and eight figure companies in this group, like highly, highly successful people, but it's just a real down to earth group of people. So uh, I guess during COVID, were you guys meeting virtually via Zoom? Yeah. Yeah. We had to, we had to do virtual, but we took it, man. We took that up to a, a crazy level. Uh, we work with a, the production company that puts together among other people. He work they work with Tony Robbins. They're used to doing high end uh, events and they came up with a virtual event that is absolutely mind blowing. Our events called flip hacking live every year. We do it in October. Um, but we went on location. The speakers went live to a studio on stage with cameras and things. I mean, it was a full on production. You saw it on the internet, like you you logged in like, you know, online, but so it was virtual, but it was run like a live event. It was very, very cool. What's it cost to join? So uh, there's two masterminds within seven figure flipping and the guy who owns the company, Bill Allen is a Navy pilot. So the, it's kind of aviation theme. So the the first group that's for more beginner level is called the runway group, right? They're on the runway. And the other group, it's for a little bit higher level. You have to have a certain criteria. You have to have made a certain amount of money and done a certain amount of deals. That's called the altitude group, right? When you're at altitude, you're kind of in the sky. So the runway group is $15,000 a, a year. And the altitude group is $25,000 a year. So let me ask something. When you guys have been connecting over the past um, six months, I'm kind of curious what people are saying specific to their tactics to overcome the inventory shortages across the entire United States and most you know markets across the entire U- U.S. Uh, inventories at a crazy, crazy low price. Um, we're seeing crazy appreciation rates, um, and finding deals is incredibly difficult. Um, there's been the more you know the the Fed is not allowing foreclosures yet, um, and so I'm just kind of curious like. You know, is anybody expanding their buy box to find opportunities? Like, I guess as an example, instead of like, you know, wholesaling uh, single family homes, are they, you know, getting into buying office buildings and trying to convert them into condos or buying land and trying to do RV parks? Like, you know, what, what are people talking about in terms of alternative strategies to deploy capital? 
I'm sure people are doing that. Our members are pretty, we have pretty focused members. We don't get into like trailer parks and commercial stuff like that. We pretty much focus on flipping wholesaling and landlords. Now, if you've been in real estate for more than, let's just say 12 years, then you have gone through a major correction, right? Back in 08, 09, we, we had a major correction. There are people in our group who have been in real estate since the early 2000s and late 90s, right? So they've seen a couple different market cycles. The fact of the matter is, the people ask me all the time, people who don't know me as well, but they know I'm in real estate and they'll say, how's the market, right? And my answer is the same every time, it's great. The market doesn't have good and bad. There's no such thing as good and bad. The market is the market. How you modify your business, to your point, the things that you do to to work within the, the market that you're currently in makes all the difference in the world. So for our members, we're not necessarily talking about RV parks and commercial because we don't really, that's outside of our lane. We try to be very focused and very good at what we do, and that's outside of our lane. But what we do tell people is, as far as like the eviction restrictions and things like that, what that does is it tends to make current landlords very stressed out and it and it it creates an opportunity, frankly, for people who have these these tenants that aren't paying, landlords are a little bit quicker to pull the trigger on offers when they know they can't evict somebody. They get a little stressed and they start dealing a little bit looser with, with their deals. Now, the other thing that happens is, and this happens even in any market, right? You have these companies out there that have a lot of buying power and they're big and they're powerful. And, and people complain, how do I compete with these companies that are doing like you know, 100, 200, 300 deals a month? It works in a market with low inventory too. The key is you need to be quick. You need to be quick to leads. You need to speed the lead makes all the difference in the world right now because the biggest problem you have with this market is sellers know it's white hot. So that seller who might have sold you their house for 50 cents on the dollar, they want 80 cents now because everyone's emboldened by the fact that their house is worth more than it's ever been before. But the reality is, let's go back to the basics. And this is what I would tell any of our members. Let's go back to the basics for a minute. Who are we buying from? Are we buying from people whose houses, when it comes to flipping and wholesaling, are we buying from people who have a house that needs no work, they're in no hurry, and they have time to sit and let it go on the market and let people walk through? That's never been our client. It's never been the seller that we want to talk to. We want to talk to the sellers that have uh, frankly, life situations that makes them a little more open to selling to somebody with cash and getting a little bit less. That could be death, divorce, job loss, job relocation, downsizing, the house is in extreme disrepair. All of those things don't know that there's a pandemic and all of those things don't know that the market's great or the market's bad or the inventory is high or inventory is low. It's, it's independent of all of that, right? So if I, if my wife serves me with divorce papers tomorrow and I need to sell my house very, very fast, I need to sell my house very, very fast. So at that point, you need to get to that appointment faster than your competition and you're still going to have an opportunity. So I, I'm really, to be honest with you, I don't think the move in any market is, hey, I'm a house flipper and I'm good at it and I like it. The inventory is low. I'm going to go into commercial. The inventory is low. I'm going to go into a trailer park. Like, if you do that, in my opinion, you will always be chasing markets. You will always be chasing your tail, and you'll never get fantastic at anything because you're so quick to change the minute the market has any fluctuation. I think you need to double down and be laser focused on what you're great at. Personally, what's your opinion of iBuyers? buyers? How have they affected the wholesalers and house flippers out there? I mean, they're charging convenience fees pretty close to their realtor fees and they'll buy the house as is, you know, don't require repairs, you know, like pretty sweet deal for the consumer. Yeah. yeah. How's that affecting you guys? You know, it's possible sometimes to buy from those folks and it's possible to sell to those folks. But in general, it's, it's like this. What here's the question you're asking, right? Forget the word I buyer for a minute. What does competition do to you? What, what does competition mean to you? Competition to me means I have to get better at what I do. I have to get faster. I have to get leaner and I have to have better processes. So I buyers to me represent nothing more than competition in the market. And that competition could come from Zillow or any place else. It could come from another wholesaler or house flipper in my market that just has their crap together and they know what they're doing. I just have to be faster than them. I have to offer something that's better than them. And by the way, sometimes those don't work out so well because it is not as personal as you can be. So what advantages do you have over iBuyers? You're local. You live there. You know the neighborhoods well. You can talk the talk of that market. 
remember what I said our client was. Our client's not 20 something, not some young, young urban professional who's like totally great with technology and they don't care about personal touch. We're talking typically to people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. These are folks who love to be able to sit down knee to knee with someone, you know, and not in a pandemic time. They love someone who will slow down and explain things to them. And they love someone who is local to them. It just makes a difference. So lean into those things. I, I think it makes a difference. And we can absolutely compete with iBuyers. I'm not concerned about iBuyers. It's, it's making it more difficult in some cases, but it's not making it impossible. And frankly, like I said, last year, if the pandemic hadn't happened, we would not have had our best profit year to date. We wouldn't have. We would have had nothing sharpening our sword. The pandemic sharpened our sword. iBuyers, sharpen your sword. So don't look at at, at you know something that can sharpen your sword as just a rock or something that's in your way, use it to sharpen your sword and get better. Mike, before we close out the show, just I'm, I'm thinking what's the audience, what's going through their head right now? Um, you mentioned direct mail, super hot. Um, who do you use for direct mail? Like, you know, just disbursement. And then with AdWords, do you have a provider you use, somebody you outsource it to? So for AdWords, we do it in I do it in house. I have a, a marketing manager that that handles that for me. Um, there are some great companies out there that can help you with that. God, a friend of mine has one, and I can't think what it's called. I think it's called Spark something. Uh, Andy McFarlane is he has a company called Spark. I, it's really really great. I would use him if I didn't have it in house for direct mail. Uh, we get our list from List Source, so it's pretty common. Most people use List Source; it's not a big deal. But as far as the mail house that we use, it's a mail house in Florida. I, I don't, I'll mention them. I don't care to give them a plug. It's called Evergreen Printing. They're great. Um, if you're part of seven figure flipping, you get big discount using them. But um, I've used them for years. I think they're fantastic. So my list comes from List Source. I send that list to Evergreen. They have the, you know, the mock up of the card, the, the couple of cards that I use, and we just cycle through them. And by the way, it's when it comes to cards, just a little quick tip to throw in, because I learned this through a lot of trial and error and wasting a lot of money. Intuitively, I thought graphics, more information is better. And what I have found over the years is less is more when it comes to marketing and when it comes to like letters and postcards. Do not fill a postcard or a letter with tons and tons and tons and tons of information. It overwhelms people and a confused mind says no. So pair it that whatever you think you have to say, like cut it in half. It's fine. All you're trying to do is get the phone to ring so you can engage that person one on one on the phone or in person. Do not try to sell them on the postcard or on the letter. That's that's not the place to do it. You need to pique their interest and get them to call. Great. Mike, where can we uh, where can the audience check out your book? You can go to Amazon. It's called Level Jumping. You can get it there. If you want to go to MikeSimmons.com, you can buy it there as well. Uh, and then my I have my podcast, Just Start Real Estate. So you can go check me out there as well. Cool. Mike, thanks so much for being on CEO Secrets today. Thanks, man. I appreciate you having me. For everybody tuning in, make sure you hit that subscribe button if this is your first time to uh, listen to the podcast. Um, we also post this uh, in our private Facebook group where you can watch it live. And um, you can also check it out on Spotify, iTunes, all that good stuff. And uh, Mike, thanks again so much. You, you dropped some uh, some great nuggets and um, great, to, uh, great to connect with you on here. And I uh, can't wait to read your book. Hey, thanks for having me, Chris. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Tune in next time. Bye, everybody.